All right, can you hear me? Can you see me? All right, can you hear me? Can you see me? Beautiful. All right, can you hear me? Can you see me? Can you hear me? Can you see me? All right. All right. We are live. We'll wait for a few people to uh, join. Uh, join. What's going on, guys? Hope everyone's well. Hope everyone's well. Just waiting on a few people to join. And we'll get started. How's the quality? Uh, anyone comment? How's the quality? Everything's good. Can you hear me? What have we got? I was a couple of minutes late to the stream. We had a few difficulties with uh, the software, but we're think, I think we're good to go. Software. Thanks, Trey. Appreciate that, mate. Thanks, Trey. Appreciate that, mate. All right, it's a bit of an echo, so just fix that now. There we go. All right, that sound should be better. All right, I'll just wait for a couple more people that I know are going to join. Just check what's happening. Do, 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 do. Orcus Lacer. Boom, boom, boom. All right, how many we got? Five people watching. What's going on, guys? Where are we tuning in from? Just wait a couple more minutes and uh, we'll get cracking. We'll get started. Do do do. Bum, 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 bum. All right. So, yeah, there'll be part two of uh, the part one. I uploaded part one yesterday, which was uh, to do with the G code. So, you can add any custom printer you like um, to the actual uh, Orc Slicer um, and also parallel with Cura Slicer as well. So, um, another thing, too, in case you're not, you're not aware of, uh, Cura has just released a new update. Uh, to their slicer um, that's incorporating something similar to scarf joint. Um, if you don't know what scarf joint is, we're going to go through that today as well. 
um, and that's in Orca Slicer. So if you're not sure about that, I'm currently running Orca Slicer 2, um, which is the latest beta version. I think it's almost a full release. Um, and it's also got some um, flow correction, which is actually quite interesting. So I'll be able to show you that as well. So that'll be good. So we can go through that. Um, just go through a couple more. Hey guys. All righty. Do do do. We are going to get started in a minute. So for those of you who are sticking around, we'll get started in a second. I'm just uh, going to post a couple more. Get some more people on board that may have forgotten about it. There we go. And where are we? Good, 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 good. And just one more before we get started. Alrighty, uh, just two seconds. If anyone's got anything they specifically want to know um, in regards to, all right, that's, in regards to Orca Slicer, as far as, um, where are we? That's the wrong file. I'll get rid of this one. As far as, uh, let's move on to Orca. So if anyone's got anything they're interested in knowing um, in regards to fine detail printing, um, and also, where are we? The new settings that are in Orca Slicer that I'm going to run through today. Um, just comment below and uh, we'll see if we can help you out with that. So, let's go with this. Oh, let's just double check. All right, we'll get started. What are we at? Nearly 15 minutes past. We'll give it two more minutes uh, and we'll start for those who are fashionably late. For those of you who don't know, um, I'm Chris. I run Chris's Creations on YouTube and facebook and twitter and instagram and all the all the other ones um i've been 3 bit printing for five years i've got a background in mechanical engineering uh i rebuild motorcycles and do prototype parts for through 3d printing uh, i'm also a mechanical fitter um i've got quite a vast experience in those sort of things so yeah i'm also an affiliate with creality uh coprint which is a new multi color system it's coming out all right. All right, so let's get started. What are we at? Yeah, it's 14 past. We'll jump into it. All right, so when we look at Orca Slicer, when you want to do, uh, for instance, the first thing you want to look at when you create a profile, um, as you can see, I've got a list of 3D printers in there. Um, one of the things you want to look at to start off with is to make sure that you have all your set settings dialed in. So obviously what you want to do to start off with is make sure that you've completed the calibration process, uh, which is under here. So your temperature, your flow rate, pressure advance, retraction, and then do your testing. The main ones I find, uh, not so much the temperature testing, but mainly the flow rate, pass one and two, pressure advance and retraction. With those ones, they're the, probably the most three critical ones that you can go through. Um, outside of that, when you've done that and you've dialed in your pressure advance, which is under PLA settings, you can see for the K1 Max, I have got my flow rate at 0 0.098 and pressure advance 0 0.32. So let's load up a model and uh, let's see what we can do with it. So we'll get an intricate model and we'll show you what it's like when we do something that's got uh, quite a lot of uh, characteristics into it. So let's go with uh, where are we? 
we'll get a full character. Let's go with a military figurine. We'll go with a US soldier. All right, now normally these sort of parts will be reserved for resin printing. Now obviously resin printing is gonna give you a lot more detail. I'm just gonna scale this up so we can see that a bit better. All right, we might even go a bit bigger again, I think. All right, there we go. So we'll zoom in on that. Now, as you can see there, we've got a World War II US veteran. Now I chose this just because it's got some intricate parts. And as you can see, we've got some significant overhangs and so on. Now, normally these sort of prints are usually designed for resin printers, but with these settings that I can apply today, this print is actually quite achievable via an FDM printer. Now, how do we do that? So the first things you want to look at is obviously your layer height. A lot of people are aware of that. That's pretty obvious. Now, for when you adjust your layer height, if depending on the nozzle you're using, whether you're using 0 0.3, 0 0.6, you can go as low as 0 0.2, obviously it's gonna increase your print time. Um, even with a 0.4 layout height, you can generally get away with sticking to around a 10 or 0 0.8. Um, now with that, even if you don't use a 0 0.10 or 0 0.8, you can use a 0 0.2 um, millimeter layer height. Now, I'll just load a preset in 0 0.2 now. And there we go there. All right, so one of the things you'll notice is line width. Now, a lot of people don't, I'm not sure if people know this, but with line width, you can actually reduce the line width, which is gonna give you less separation between your lines on the scaling as the print goes up. And that's really important because when your layers are actually flowing through and building up uh, and extruding, the variance is between the first layer and outer layer line width and the top surface is probably the most crucial parts to allowing for the steps of each layer as it bridges out and, and bridges in. And the second one to that is making sure that your outer wall and inner wall are as closely matched as possible, but not to make sure that your inner wall is too far outside your uh, nozzle width. So for instance, with these, you can see I've dialed these down a little bit. We've got the default at 0.39, which is normally 0.42. Um, now you can go as low as 0.35, and that's gonna affect the overall width. So the width of how far the layer line extrudes, not so much the height. And that's all what this does here. Also uh, with supports, um, with the supports, you don't wanna go too thick. A lot of preset factory settings in Orca Slice, Secura, and even Creality Print they'll have the support setting usually 425 or 0.45. Now, a wider support line width, although it's great for bed adhesion, is gonna make your supports also harder to remove. So that's one thing I'm gonna go through today. I've got some prints to show you as well um, and how easy they peel off. So that's really important. So these are my default settings I have here. My first layer, I have a 0.45. Now, for a model that has a small footprint like this and has for instance, details on the bottom of the feet. As you can see there, there's some shoes and heels. If I've got a print that's got a tread pattern on the bottom of the foot, what I'll actually do is I'll reduce that for that layer line width, and that'll give me a finer detail because the thinner the layer line width, the more um, detail and less separation of the lines you'll actually get. Although the base of the model is not as important, it, you know, it is a detail. So we can drop that down to four two. And that's pretty much basically where I like to sit it. Sometimes what I can do is with the inner and outer wall, I'll even go as far as dropping this down to 3.7 and bring the inner wall down to 3.9. Now, why is that important? Well, you obviously want your inner line width to be slightly uh, wider than your outer line width. And that's because you need to make sure that when the infill is um, laid in your model, that the the first line that seals in that infill basically prevents the infill from pushing the seam of the line width out. And that's gonna affect the bridging, it's gonna affect the surface quality of your finer layer quality as well. So that's really, really important. Um, and obviously, like I said, the top surface one is, is important as well. Um, or, and I usually try to match that with the default, oh, I just realized I've changed the first layer. Oh, that's 4 too, yep. Um, I usually want to change the top surface layer to 
39 the same as the inner wall width and why is that well basically with the top layer line if you have it too thin you'll end up with a lot of parts that don't bridge absolutely 100 percent accurately or there's curves or radius or arcs that haven't been configured properly in the model itself you'll find that the top surface will have separations and you won't have um you'll have layering lines and you'll have separations in the print and holes and and little blobs and that's caused not a lot of people assume that's caused from under and over extrusion while it can be a lot of the time it's to do with your top surface quality so that's really important um so that's a good setting there so just remember those ones there the other one is seam now if you've downloaded the original uh, if you've got still running the orca slice of 1.9 there is a new one uh it's 2.0 it's a beta i think they're just releasing the final edition next week and that incorporates contour scarf joints. Now, what that does is traditionally we all hate scarf. We all sorry, we all hate uh, seam joints. And that what a seam joints does is gives us a line that we have to try and align within the model because the filament has to join somewhere. Now, uh, over at GitHub, there um, I can't remember the name of the gentleman, but I'll pop it in the link after this video is done. And what they've done is actually bring up a, a, a link for you now. Uh, where are we? We'll go to... Doo, doo, doo. Oh, here we go here. So, on printables, you can see this is a great example. So, on printables, you'll notice here that this is what the scarf joint does. So, what the scarf joint does is there's our regular seam there. And after you apply the scarf joint, what that does is it creates... It still creates a seam and a joint, but instead of having the, the joint of the seam parallel with an under extrusion and over extrusion which causes a connection line error in the print which can sometimes cause the print to look somewhat shitty um basically what it does it causes it creates an angle so it's similar to like having a 45 degree angle 30 degree angle you can change that in the settings where where it joins to the next layer of the print it actually overlaps on an angle so that it forms a adaptive 45 degree angle so that it actually lines together so that the seam becomes almost irrelevant which is a massive improvement in being able to do it so you can see from another picture just there you've got your normal seam there and that's usually aligned and then you've got your scarf joint which is almost invisible so that's a really really big thing so if you go in your orca slicer You've got your normal scar seam settings, which is aligned nearest back random. Um, and what you can do is you can change your seam gap. I always look at my seam gap and go 5%. That's as low as you can go, I feel. Because if you go lower than 5% on the seam gap, you'll find that you'll get um, a gap that where the filament, it doesn't have enough space to join. And what happens is you get an over extrude. Well, it looks like an over extrusion where the seam will bulge out. So that's really important. So with the scarf joint, you can see it's in beta there, and you've got conditional scarf joint as well. So what the scarf joint is, with you've got here, is you can got scarf and you've got contour and hole. So the, the contour is where it overlaps on a degreed angle, so it almost becomes seamless. And the contour and hole basically makes it so that you've got, um, how do I explain it? You've got a, the same overlapping seam, but at the same time, you've got um, an internal bridge that seals it to make it a little bit stronger. So obviously with a seam that has a 45 degree angle, it's not going to be quite as strong. So I wouldn't recommend it for, um, you know, workshop prints or products that you want to be doing that you need to be uh, superficially strong um, within, within reason. Um, but for anything to do with models or just general projects, um, it's a great option. I've used it um, in multiple models so far under testing and to be honest i i can't even see the same um unless i use silk um pet g uh, or pla you can see or a satin a really a gloss satin you can just see it but it's so so minimal it's it's a real game changer so scarf settings what do we apply if we want detailed prints so the best settings you can apply for say a character model like this for a fine detailed print we'll jump into it right now so 5% seam gap is awesome. Scarf joint on contour gives you the best overlapping seam without actually having it. Uh, where are we? Oops, sorry guys, I got carried away. What have we got here? 
Uh, let's have a look here. Let's. Sorry, guys. Just reading the chat box here. Hello, I have a problem with my 3D printer from Way. I'm even effing pissed off doing this. <laughs> well, that's one way to say it. Does someone know a lot about 3D printers? Yeah, well, I do have a certain knowledge about it. I have an Ender 3 5 Plus 3D printer. Um, well, I, I can cover that in another series, but at the moment, I'm just looking at fine detail prints and settings. Uh, like what's going on. I'm really mad at this. I mean, why it doesn't show on the 3D printer screen the SD card. Can someone please help reply? Should I do? Do I have to download something? Okay, so I can't really comment on that right now, but if you contact me on my Facebook page, which is uh, chris.creations on Facebook, I'll post that link uh, in the comments section uh, below once the video is finished. Um, you can DM me and I'll see if I can sort that out for you, Way. So if that's how you pronounce it, Way or Way, um, we'll look at doing that for you. So that's fine. We can look at taking care of that afterwards. All right, so moving on. So with the scarf joint, obviously conditional scarf joint. So what we want that what that does is that actually when you apply the layering over the seam, that actually makes sure that it's similar to an ironing process where it slows the nozzle down and makes sure that the seam has been sealed because it once again it overlaps in a 45 degree angle, so it becomes almost seamless, um, and then it pr provides a a a scarf joint sealing layer over the top to reinforce that interlocking joint of the seam. And that really makes that seam almost invisible. Um, so as far as that, the scarf joint speed, once again, you can decrease that. Now for an intricate model like that, I would recommend reducing that scarf speed to 50%. Now, why is that? Well, because you're interlocking two seams together, the slower you go, the more uniform you can get that seam to actually fuse together through the filament that's um, now become soluble. And that will, in the end, create a, a better quality seam. Um, scarf start height, I leave at zero because basically once you've set it to aligned, it'll set the scarf seam automatically through Secura, which is great. And the steps you don't need to worry about as well. I generally leave it as 10 as the minimum, which is, which is fine. Now, for scarf joints for inner walls, I do have that selected. And why that is, is so that your seam becomes uniform. And what I mean by that is, with your inner line width of the wall, and then your outer line width of the wall, which is to do with how many layers you put down on your model. So whether you have two layers on quality, on, on strength, or three or four or five, what that's going to actually do is it's actually going to make sure that um, you have the inner light, inner walls um, relay the scarf joint as well. So it's going to match with the outer wall, which means the seam's going to be um, almost seamless, which is great. Um, also, the other thing is too, is to wipe. So what happens is the nozzle will stop extruding as it comes to the seam connection, and that's going to allow for, for the um, nozzle not to over-extrude and make the seam even better again. So I would generally select that. Um, Things like wipe on loops and wipe before external loop, what they basically are is when they finish and go through a layer, what they do is they uh, change the flow rate so that it runs the remaining uh, part of the filament um, so that you don't get over extrusion in between the layers, which is really important. Now, wipe on loops is optional. You don't have to do that because that affects the inner layer. But if you do have heavy infill that may push the inner and outer walls outwards, then I would su suggest putting that in there, especially if you've got a high infill above, say, 25%. That would be one that you'd want to select. Um, arc fitting is relevant. We want that because we want in models like this, we want to be able to create good contours uh, without uh, ridges um, and precise wall. So with precise wall, we want to provide... Uh, Orca the opportunity to make sure that the layer, layer consistency changes the same and that affects the volume metrics of the flow rate as well. So that's one you want to select. Ironing we don't want on a model because that's going to put our surfaces flat, which we don't want. And the wall gener generator is optional. Uh, I choose Arachne, which is a newer version. It's up to you whether you want to use classical Arachne and everything else in there is stock. 
Printing wall order. For intricate models that have a lot of overhang and a lot of bridges, like this model would have here, um, you want to make sure that you select in this option, inner, outer, inner. And why that is, is because when it does the printing order, it'll allow the walls to overlap slightly with each other. And that'll create a stronger bond when it's bridging and when it's printing curves in the print. And that'll give you a better uh, layer adhesion and obviously hold up to the models uh, the models dimensions, creating a better, better print accuracy and a more uniform print model. Um, print infill first, we'll leave that and everything else there. Oh, the other big one. If you've got the new Orca Slicer, we have a new feature called Small Area Flow Compensation. Now it says beta, but it works really well. They're just fine tuning some things. But basically what that does is it has the flow compensation um, numbers configured preset in it. And what it does is it actually detects the flow rate of the print when it, sl when it slices the print. Um, it'll actually automatically configure when to adjust the flow rate based on any particular zones of the print. So say, for instance, we've got this gentleman's mustache and we've got these slow overhangs on his baggage and so on like that. What that's actually going to do is it's going to adjust the compensation, the flow rate. So your max flow rate might be 22 to 20 on a K1 Max from Creality or a K1 Speedy. Um, and they vary between printers. Obviously, that's done through calibration and factory settings, which will be in another video. But from that small area flow compensation, what that's going to do is it's going to allow for the flow compensate the flow rate to reduce slightly, so that it can print even more uh, uniform layering to achieve the best detail possible. So that's really a new feature, and it's worked out really well. I found that intricate parts with that on has improved my layering lines to almost non-existent. So. Um, it's really amazing. Um, if you've seen the uh, shorts video I put up, I showed on my YouTube channel and Facebook as well. Um, I put a video up of some of the models that I've done with the scarf joint and flow rate compensation. And one of the models in particular I did, which was a Wednesday um, statue, a model um, from the Wednesday TV series for my daughter. That came out as detailed, like even the shoelaces were like perfection. Uh, and they were only two to 1.5 to two millimeters. And even the actual uh, pattern on the shoe, which was only three millimeter, four millimeters big, came out as well and as detailed as an 8K resin printer. And that's impressive. So for people who say you can't do detailed prints with FDM printers, you can, especially with Orca Slice's new settings but you just need to make sure you have the right settings dialed in and obviously speed's a factor and bridging's a factor too. So we'll get into that. Um, now bridging, I won't touch on too much at the moment because that's I'll do that for another video as we'll be here all day. Um, obviously you wanna detect overhangs. Now what you can do as well as an option is you can make overhangs printable. So in these models in particular, I'll just zoom out. Um, when you have overhangs, for instance, we'll zoom in on his backpack. Now this part here, right here and these parts here and the undercarriage and so on when they have a, a an angle that ranges from say 60 degrees to a 90 degree right angle it becomes a little bit harder for an fdm printer to print and that's because the filament that it extrudes out of the nozzle is round and not square and you can only get an fdm printer to print right angles to a certain degree um, and it will never be a perfect right angle so to prevent pillowing or pillowing or uh, stringing when you have a bridge, which is when the bridge doesn't fuse perfectly across and you have filament that sags down, what you can do is you can make, you can click the make overhangs printable. Now what that's gonna do, it says that it can change the geometry of the print, but what it'll actually, it won't change the print entirely. What it'll do is when there's any areas of a print where it comes out at a direct 90 degree angle, it will actually change the dimension, so it, instead of it being a direct 90 degree right or left angle, it'll change it to around 75 degrees to 85 degrees with a curvature, um, a radius at the very edge of it, allowing for the bridging and the right angle to be printed 
um, more uniformly so that you get no corner under or over extrusion, no filament um, blobs, and you don't get any um, uh, pillowing or stringing on that area of the print. Now, it, it, it's there is a video I'll, on that as well. I'll post that in the link. Um, but overall, it doesn't change the model prints that well. Um, it's up to you whether you apply that. I find that that works quite well on these type of models. Um, I've printed dragons. I've printed, you know, lots of different detailed statues and and lots of, uh, you know, dimensional uh, 3D files that have a massive array of overhangs and it's worked quite well. On this page, as far as quality, one of the big things that a lot of people don't utilize is a feature called reverse on odd and reverse only on perimeters. Now, what that actually does is it's not as important for PLA printing or PETG, but it is important for ASA, ABS, um, carbon fiber, uh, PLA, carbon fiber, PETG, or any, any uh, print where you're having trouble with bed adhesion, and especially with a small footprint. And what that's going to do is instead of running the uh, extruder nozzle in one continuous movement, what it's going to do is it's going to run the extruder in an opposite direction. So it's going to go from left to right or clockwise to anti-clockwise. And what that's going to do is it's going to give you a better bridging effect in because it's going to run the opposite direction. So it's going to basically allow any bridging to have an anchor point because as one seam travels through the other, the other one overlaps at the opposite direction creating a stronger uh, locking point for each filament intersection. Um, and that drastically improves bridging. So that's one feature you can really do. Now, you've got a percentage that you can adjust there. Um, you can adjust that, but from my evaluations, unless you're doing huge bridging, which generally a lot of people don't do, I would leave that at zero from my testing. It's been flawless and it's worked well within the constraints of, of the algorithm that's been set in Orca itself. So that's that. So what we'll do now is we'll just go on to strength. Obviously with strength, not a big issue. We're not worried with that so much. We'll leave that stock. We'll come back to that later. Now with these sort of parts, speed's a big thing. So you do, obviously don't want to be printing fast. Now with first layers on intricate models, I would recommend around 25 to 30 millimeters a second. With, a, with an infill of no more than 75 millimeters, because when you're printing, uh, for instance, we'll measure this point here. And when we measure, when we look at a, a space like this, you can see that from here to here is 26 millimeters. Now, within 26 millimeters, if you have your first layer infill at higher than 55 to 75 millimeters per second, it is going to be going as fast as what it would be on a large print at 250 millimeters a second because it only has a small space to travel within. So the speed is going to be way too fast to be able to print the detail of a small footprint. So what we want to do is make sure that that's only at double or 25% above double of the first layer. So anywhere between 50 and 75 millimeters for a small footprint print uh, print for infill layering is perfect. I would probably suggest putting that at 55 and what that's going to do is allow it not to be too fast so that you get a good layer uh, infill that's going to give you good bed adhesion and it's not going to give you under or over extrusion on a small footprint. And the other thing you would want to do to lessen the chance of stringing is to slow down your initial travel speed so that the extruder has enough time to retract um, the filament with it before it actually shoots across to the next layer on the opposite end. Being a small footprint, it's gonna jump across really quickly. Now, if your travel speed is set at 500 millimeters a second, as you can see here, then that means that it's gonna travel 26 millimeters at 500 millimeters a second. Now, if you've got a retraction setting, setting at two or 2.5 or even four, and you've got it between 50 millimeters a second, 60 millimeters a second, there is no way that the nozzle is going to have enough time to retract the filament before it gets the other end so you're going to get stringing all over here because the retraction is not going to have a chance to engage and it's not going to be able to retract the filament fast enough so with that what you want to do 
is make sure that your initial retraction percentage is no more than 30 to 40 percent so 40 percent is good and the number of slow layers with a small character print or even a large character print with a lot of detail i would generally go between three and four layers and that's to make sure that with a small footprint you get relatively great bed adhesion because the last thing we want to do is have it lifting off now as far as speeds are concerned you do want to slow things right down now as you can see the outer wall normally these settings are around 200 300 and so on and 270 for infills but that is way too fast for a model of this complexity so we don't want to have that so these settings are the settings i use here now in a wall you could probably drop down to 75 for a, for a character model like this and the small perimeter percentage so small perimeter percentage what that does is anything that is of 10 percent or in millimeters or percentage so we'll look say for instance it's 10 percent um of the maximum speed is what it's going to print any small perimeters so any small perimeters for instance these guard belts on here the shoelaces on the model um the backpack intricate parts the button all the areas which we'll get rid of the ruler all the areas um that are on the the knurling on his backpack there his accessory shovel all these intricate parts including the rifle it's going to slow down to 10 percent you can play around with it 10 to 20 percent is fine um and that'll work well for you um the other one is what have we got here so I would suggest 50% outer wall, uh, sorry, 50 millimeters outer wall, 75 millimeters inner wall with a small perimeter of 10%. Um, small perimeter threshold, generally with a, with a character model with this much detail, five millimeters is perfect. You can go as high as 10 millimeters. And what that means is it's gonna make sure that anything that's 10 millimeters or shorter is going to be printed at 10% of the maximum speed. And for us, that's 50 millimeters a second. So although it will slow down your print, just like a resin printer doesn't print as fast as a FDM printer can, you will be able to print these type of models with an FDM printer uh, with the similar detail or close to as close to detail as you can get out of an FDM printer as an, as a, say a 4K resin printer. You will have some stringing and so on, a little bit of imperfections here or there. But for an FDM printer, it will turn out amazingly. Like I said, if you look at my shorts video I released on my Facebook channel and YouTube channel, you'll see a selection of models I, sh I show there, uh, of which have some busts, He-Man busts, and some other models and statues. And the quality is next to none. You would think it was from a resin printer. So sparse infill. Um, that's generally 270, which is its full percentage. You can see I'll put that in half at 135 millimeters a second. I would generally look at doing that for this, being that the outer wall and inner wall is 50, I wouldn't go any higher than double. So I would set that as 100, as well as the internal as well. Now, the difference between Orca and Cura is the wording. A lot of people have trouble with Orca Slicer because um, the simple fact that uh, Orca Slice's wording is very different to Cura. Cura uses uh, settings like outer wall speed, inner wall speed. I find Cura is a little bit under, easier to understand. Um, and instead of having sparse infill and internal solid infill, they just have infill and then crosshatch infill, So, um, which is a little bit under, easy to understand. Um, so the solid infill is generally the, the connecting internal layer lines and the sparse infill is the internal... Um, infill for the pattern itself whether it's great you know, grid contour and so on and so on and so on now one of the other things you want to look at too is the gap infill so for up for myself with intricate models i don't apply gap fill i select um nowhere rather than everywhere because with character models you don't want any gap infill because you tend to get um, the outer walls and inner walls pushed out which affects your model so we can leave that there because of oh, you could just press in the other setting I'll show you shortly, um, we, we, we deselect gap infill. We don't, we don't need that. As far as supports are concerned, when you've got intricate models like this and you've got relatively small supports with a small footprint, as you can see here in this model, I printed a, you can see this here. So in this model here, 
I've printed an actual, whoop, get that in front of the screen. I've printed an actual, uh, this is a, a lower sleeve for a Batman Shogun helmet, and I've used tower supports. Whoop, sorry about that. The audio, the video isn't picking that up. Now, you can see how easy I pull this off. with one hand. And as you can see, if I can get them the image properly, there we go. That came off like nothing. So that came off very, very well. So you can see the footprint there is very fine. Now that's the type of footprint we, what we need to deal with when we're dealing with intricate supports. Now, Obviously, with using supports, the less uh, material you can use for supports, the more filament you save. So that's a win-win because then we don't have to spend as much money on filament. So for us, we want to make sure that the filament speed is no more than the inner wall speed because we're going to have small footprint supports and we don't want the supports to go too fast because then we don't get adhesion. And especially if you're using tree supports, which a lot of time print at different angles, you can get uh, supports, especially tree supports that won't, will let go and won't fuse properly. So with those sorts of things, no more than 75 millimeters a second. Obviously we want to slow down for overhangs and with overhangs, you can have classic mode or you can just have the normal slow down for perimeters. Um, I prefer classic mode for small models. You find, I find it has more better set perimeters for intricate parts. Now the other option is to, with you do character models, is to reduce the speed from 500 in travel speed to 300. Now, when you're doing travel speed reduction, it won't decrease your print time that much at all. Um, anything from 500 to 300 is relatively minor in print time, unless you're printing a model that's going to take between, you know, 8 to 16, 20 plus hours, which you wouldn't use these settings for anyway, because that would be a larger print. So it's irrelevant. Um, as far as that goes, everything else there is fine. The other thing we want to look at is the most important thing, which is supports. So... I'll just put the go there. So support. So that's a really important thing. So with supports, the biggest thing you want to look at, I personally prefer tower supports over tree supports. And why I prefer that is because I find tower supports, you can adjust the density of the support itself. As you've seen in the uh, helmet base I showed you before, how easy those tower supports, zigzag support, tower supports were to peel off. And they didn't actually cause any fusion to the print itself. Now, you, I do have tree supports that can do that as well. In the video I posted on my channel, you'll see I had a tree support there where the tree support broke off and it was fine. But sometimes if you increase the layers too much, you will get some tree supports that will fuse to the print. So I do prefer uh, normal uh, print towers or zigzag towers. And I usually go with a threshold no more than 35, unless I've got large um, prints or helmets and things like that, um, then yeah. So I'll look at going for this one, 35, and the first layer density, so that the, the filament density isn't too uh, thick, I generally go with 70%. Now, you can remove small overhangs, but I don't do that. And you can have on-build plate. Now, with character models, you don't want on-build plate because there's going to be areas of the model where you actually have things like this between the shoulders and the helmet, which you obviously need supports for. So we'll deselect that. Uh, raft layers we don't need. Now, most important, top Z difference. So the top Z distance and the bottom Z distance is what... Um, the distance between the print on the bottom and the print at the top that the supports print between. So if you model uh, the helmet of the actual uh, character and the shoulder of the characters here, you've got your bottom Z height distance and your top Z height distance, and that's the distance between the model that it's going to print supports with the final top layer. And, and you don't want that too close because it's then going to fuse to the model and then it's going to create very hard support layers to remove and it's going to damage your print. So 
To adjust that, I've found the best settings for top seed distance is 0 0.208. And for the bottom, I've found the best seat support distance is 0 0.22. I've found that to be very good. And also, the, one of the most important things is to change the base pattern to rectolinear rather than default because we don't want the slicer to automatically assume what pattern we want um, on top of the tree supports or the tower supports that support the model right under the layer because sometimes the slicer will choose incorrect uh, support that, that's right under the layer we're printing or on, on top and that'll cause issues with fusion. So we do that for both. Change that to rectilinear. Top surface layers and bottom surface layers, two's fine. If you go higher than that, I find that there's too many um, lines and and um, parts of the print that can still get stuck to the print. Um, so, you know, that can be a bit harder to remove. Um, and then you've got your top interface spacing um which we don't which you can change but i find between 0 0.55 and 0 0.5 for the top interface and the bottom interface i generally leave as just normal 0.5 um, the reason why i don't change the bottom so much and more the top is because with the top it's generally supporting bridges and they're more important than the bottom of the support which it's resting on so that's a big thing there as well um that's pretty much basically it from there. So what we'll do now is we'll just go into other. Uh, we'll just check that. Now we want to brim with new use supports. You generally want to brim because that's going to aid in helping the uh, print supports itself. Um, so whenever you print supports, it's good to have that. And pretty much everything else for what we need is all there and done. So that's that. Now, the last and final step before we slice this model, we'll go and is, we'll slice this model now, and you'll be able to see in a moment, just grab a drink, what this looks like, and we'll go through the parameters. Oh, excuse me. And it's um, just about done. And then, then we'll be able to look at how it's done the towers. All right. Now, doesn't that look like a mess? <laughs> so, as you can see, we have supports all over the whole device. Now, for a character model that is roughly, uh, what are we looking at? 150 to 170 millimeters in height. For a model that intricate, you could speed that up, and that's going to take 15 hours. Now, you could speed that up, and you probably could double the, the, the speeds, but you won't get the intricate print, and that's really important. So, everyone loves, loves fast prints, but unfortunately, when it comes to character models and really fine detail prints, you can't print fast. You need to really print slowly, and that's just how it is, unfortunately. Um, you know, and... It is what it is. Obviously, resin printers, you couldn't do a model this size on a resin printer as yet because there's not many printers above 200 millimeters um, that can do that um, at all. So, you know, if you wanted to do a model like this, you'd have to either slice it and cut it in parts and do one part on a resin printer and then another part on a resin printer, and then you've got to fuse it together, and that creates more work. So the other way you can increase this is by decreasing the layer lines, decreasing your infill, um, and so on. But this is ideal. Now, if you print this successfully, you can increase the speed slightly, and you can reduce the, that printing time down. And you can also change the infill as well, if you like, as well. So, um, for instance, if we go to back to prepare, and we go to, where are we, strength, and we can change the wall loops to two. We don't need three wall loops. And we can change the infill. We'll leave. We'll change grid. And we could use gyroid tends to use more. We could choose honeycomb. Apply gap fill nowhere, which is really important. We don't want gap fill because that's going to push intricate layer lines out. Um, and we'll slice that. 
and see how we go. And then we have one more final step to go. Now, if anyone has any questions, chime in. If you're not sure on something or you want to know something else in regards to fine detailed character prints and uh, layering lines and supports, let me know. And the next one I'll show you is a support for tree supports. All right, so there we are there. Now, if we zoom in and we go through the layer heights, you'll see right there. We have perfectly fused perfectly fused, perfect layering heights for every segment that needs supports all the way down. So that should provide us with every single overhang supported for a really good bridged detailed support. Now, with tree supports, one thing to remember, as opposed to uh zigzag tower supports what i call normal supports tree supports will use more filament in character models because they have to create branches that have angles rather than fine lines that just stem straight up so keep that in mind as you can see we're only using for this whole model although it's taken 11 hours now that i've changed the infill rather than 15 hours we just took four hours off that total print time by changing it from grid to honeycomb and reducing one layer line from three down to two. We've cut back the print time to 11 hours from 15. And if you have a look over here, for this character model, which is 150 to, I think it's 165 millimeters high, we're only using 86 grams of filament. Now, I don't know about you, but 86 grams of filament is uh, awesome. <laughs> that is really, really good. So, you know, that's, a really relatively good way to get prints to do that. Now, as you can see, you'll see there's a seam there. Now, that seam won't be there because we've used contour scarf joints. So when you go into it, you can see we've got the scarf joint speed and we've got inner and outer walls. So although it doesn't show it there, that joint will be the overlapping joint for the scarf joint. So with that said, what we're going to do now is if you wanted to make this model even better and not have these cylindrical layer lines and ridges on your prints because the prints obviously are melting extrusions and we're using a 0.4 millimeter layer line what you can then do is you can use adaptive layers i tend to go down to 0.7 from 50 choose adaptive and anywhere you see red or orange means that it's going to increase the layer line width and potentially cause um, a layer to be shifted outwards. Now, if you look on that right-hand side here, this is going to show you the adaptive layers in millimeters of what it's doing. So you can see that's 0.8 there, and then it goes right up to 19, 22, and so on and so on. So we want to bring that down because we don't want these layers to protrude. So what we do is just we can bring press smooth, and the more you press that, the more it's going to adjust that layer line width. And now when you look at the right bar, the extrusion width is more consistent and no longer has spikes in the layering. Now that will affect the print time, but the print quality of this model will be fantastic. Now after this live stream, I'm actually going to print this model and then I will post a short and have it in my next part three uh, video which I'll be discussing, which will be speed adjustments and best features for helmets and uh, cast model intricate uh, parts and strength. So, and also how to calibrate the printers as well. So that'll be another one. And then obviously I will be doing a Cura tutorial as well. But moving back to this, you can see that that's been improved. So you can see now, you can keep pressing that if you want that's going to be a lot better and you can see at the top that ridge is now almost gone so we can probably get that a little bit better if we wanted to although you could sand it but we'll just go a little bit more keep pressing keep pressing and as you can see it dissipates even more so now when we slice this you're going to see a big difference in the top of that print especially his helmet the layering lines on the top of the print 
will be a lot smoother than what they were before. And that's really important because that gives us more details and the less post-processing we have to do with filament uh, prints, uh, they, they, you know, a lot of people go, oh, well, that's going to take me longer to print. But the thing is, it might take you longer to print, but then you've also got to turn around and, and uh, have uh, more time to actually post-process and clean up your print. So if you factor in the cleaning up of your print once it's finished with your print time, it's almost the same. So look, we've jumped up the hours there to 18 hours on this print, but that's a quite large, that's quite a large print. As you can see, I think it's closer to, what do we got? Uh, our total heights we have, oh, there you go. So it's actually closer to 200 millimeters high. So it's actually quite a significant size model. Um, now, those same settings would apply to a smaller model well. So if we reduce that down to a 100 millimeter model, it will come out just the same. So to show you that, what we'll do is we'll just go to scale, we'll bring that down to 200%, boom, and bring up our adaptive again. Smooth, 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 smooth. And slice. And what this is going to do is it's going to show even more, the smaller the model, the more details required for the model itself. Um, and once again, when you do this, it's always better to start off with a smaller model and to test your features. Although the larger the model you use, the more easier it is for the FDM printer to apply the details because it's working with a larger surface area. Um, but in order to fine tune your settings and to get the best possible prints with a 3D printer for very detailed models the smaller you can go whilst maintaining detail is a true uh is a true uh, i suppose learning experience as to how much detail you can get out of an fdm printer so there you have it nine hours there uh we're using 31 grams of filament so 31 grams of filament uh i don't know about you that works out to be about a dollar a dollar a print so there you go now if we look at that those layering lines are very, very good. So now we can look at printing that and we'll see how we go. I'm gonna click print. I think my, yep, my K1 Max is on. I'm gonna upload that and I'll get that printed. Now, what I'll do is for the other option is I'm gonna to go to tree supports and I'm gonna show you the difference in tree supports and the variances. So we'll keep that as it was. And now we'll slice that with tree supports. Uh, variable layer height is not available with that. So we'll just go uh, tree slim. Actually, no. We'll go trim tree hybrid. There we go. And make sure that's adaptive. Smooth, 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 smooth. All right. Now we'll slice this. And this is with tree supports. Oh, dear. Now with tree supports, you're going to find it more than likely will take longer to print because it's a larger surface area that it has to print and it's dealing with a lot more angles to for the tree supports to reach different angles on the print itself. So that's a consideration to take into fact at play as well. So we'll just let that slice. It's going to take a couple minutes. Uh, if you are interested as well, uh, you can check out my channel. Where are we? Uh, wrong one. We'll go here. Uh, if you do want to see what scarf joints are all about, uh, this is a link to Teaching Tech. He's an Australian 3D print YouTuber, and he goes over the scarf uh, settings in more detail, and I'll link that to the description below. Uh, if you're not familiar with my channel, check out the channel. I am creating a Patreon um, affiliate link as well, and with the Patreon link, we will be getting a series of things for patreon members so we'll be looking at um, behind the scenes content of what i print and how i do it um, you'll also get um, personal experience and live support so you can message me with any issues you have um, monthly file drops so i have exclusive uh, files and different models that i get from 
exclusive sponsors and partnerships. I also get um, exclusive print designs from uh, specific designers if you're interested in different types of models, whether it's workshop design, whether it's uh, 3D printing, whether it's um, resin models as well, or if you're into character models or anime, um, cosplay, uh, whatever it is, you, I'll get those as well. And one of the bigger things I do for my exclusive Patreon members is I actually um, will able to pass on exclusive promos and discounts um, from suppliers that I'm affiliated with, which is at the moment I'm affiliated with Creality, uh, FL Sun, uh, King Rune 3D, uh, eSun Filament, and I've got two other uh, sponsors jumping on board next week. So they'll be having uh, discounts of between 20 and 40% off, which is quite huge. Um, and that's exclusive to my Patreon members only. So that's something to look out for. I'll have that in the next video. Also, I'm going to do uh, Q&A live streams, anything you want to know, and member shout outs as well. So that's something I'll be looking at doing in the next video. So back to the slice. And now, oh, there we go. So we're finished. So as you can see, we've sliced that. We've got tree supports. Now, the tree supports actually look pretty good. Now, the other thing I forgot to mention with supports is there is a section of supports where you can actually choose what types of supports to actually have. And that is a feature that is called Snug. I'm just going to find it for you. Where is it? I think it's in supports. Uh, do, 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 do. Come on, baby, where are you? Snug, snug, snug. Speed, quality, strength. Uh, it's in here somewhere. Come on, come on. Do, 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 do. I'll have to post that in the next video. Basically, there's a setting where you can adjust the support so you can make it so that it actually has uh, the supports, whether they actually are closer or further away from the print, and it becomes an option too. And that actually makes the print a lot better um, in how it uh, supports the actual print itself, which is a really good option as well. So I'm trying to find that where that is, but unfortunately, for some reason, it slipped my mind. Um, so that's an option as well to look at as well. So that's a great option. So as you can see, getting back to the print, we have four, we actually have reduced the time frame of the print. Um, actually, sorry, we've increased the time frame of the print. The other print was, I think, eight or eight hours. And now, as you can see with the tree supports, because it has to create angles rather than straight vertical print uh, supports, it's now gone from up to 10 hours. And we've also increased the amount of filament we've used by almost... 10 grams now it doesn't sound like a lot but two hours extra printing time and 10 grams per print um can add up quite significantly so as you can see there as well some of the supports haven't been supported appropriately um and and that can be you know um a problem too so that's why i prefer uh tower zigzag supports because once again tower zigzag supports being that they straight up vertical and they support the layers more uniformly you will actually always get um, better supports for bridging than what you will for tree supports. And that's that's just how it is. You cannot get um, perfect bridge supports with uh, tree supports that run on angles and curves because once again, we're printing on straight line layers. So, you know, logic would say that that makes perfect sense. Um, although tree supports are great for curved models, but mostly they're better used for models that are a larger model that don't have intricate uh, angles and uh, support features that bridge out. So that's why we prefer to use normal uh, towers. Oh, and that's what I was going to say. So the option when you have normal towers with style is you can click default and you can click snug. Now what snug does is instead of having the hexagonal uh, or zigzag uh, top and bottom layers in between the tower prints, It'll actually extrude to a point in the top and bottom of the support layer lines and making it easier to remove without having so much uh, grid or zigzag final top layers that tend to get stuck to the edges of your print. So that is a really important setting there as well. Um, 
and it also is really good for support towers um, and it reduces the biggest thing it does is it reduces when you pull the supports off of a print i'll just slice this again now while i'm talking the biggest thing is when you pull the tower supports off the print it doesn't actually cause any uh when you remove a, a support off a print sometimes it'll actually damage the print and having that setting on makes it so that it doesn't affect the quality. It doesn't actually damage the print when you're taking it off. As I showed you before, uh, earlier in the video before, when I, I showed you the, the Batman uh, helmet here, pull that back. You can see I've used snug support here on a Batman Shogun. It's the bottom neck piece. I'll literally pull that off the build plate right now for you. All right, so that's it there. And simply with that support, you can see that this way, there we go, with the light, you can see that literally comes straight off, just like that. And all those little intricate parts just peel straight off. So you don't have to worry about that. That just all breaks off. And you don't have the imperfections. Obviously we've got the brims we've got to remove but you don't have imperfections in the actual print itself. So that's a really good thing to have in your snug. So as you can see, just by going from tree supports to tower supports, you can see the tower supports are actually supporting more of the individual model itself and more intricately within the curvatures and the details of the print, which is hugely important. Um, it's a little bit trickier to remove, but nothing that a, a pair of fine nose needle pliers won't, uh, and tweezers won't fix. And as you can see, just from changing from that to from tree supports to the snug zigzag supports, um, we've reduced our printage usage to 26 grams from uh, 37, and we've reduced our model time from 10 hours 47 minutes to 8 hours and 38 minutes. So that's a significant difference in this model. So um, if there's any questions for anything else anyone wants to know. Um, that's pretty much the settings for today on how to print uh, intricate detailed models with supports and the options you have available. Um, I will post the links to the new version of Orca Slicer that includes the new uh, settings that include scarf joint, uh, snug, and um, the printer uh, flow rate uh where is it? The printing, uh, the printing flow rate correction, which I think is still in beta. Um, so I will put that link below, and also I will put the link for the scarf joint video, so you can watch that and see the comparison between the seam and that's normally there that you can reduce no later than five percent, and with scarf joint it almost disappears. So those will be in the description after the video ends. Um, I'll also print this model now, and I will post this model either in a short video, and I'll also have it on my next live on part three, which I will be posting next week, either Friday or Sunday again. Um, so yeah, if anyone else has got any questions before we finish up for today, uh, please post. Uh, you're more than welcome to leave a comment below. If there's anything that I've missed or you'd like to know about um, detailed prints um, without having to change your um, layering width or height from 0.2 to 0.8 and so on, um, you know, if you've missed it and you've just joined, feel free to watch the video again. Um, but yeah, so for that, for I'm out. Unless anyone's got anything else to say, um, I hope this video has helped you guys um, in fine-tuning your printer. Um, obviously, I've got part one there, which is how to add any custom printer with G-Code and your printer profile setup in part one, which is on my channel. Um, and part three will be coming next week, which will be speed calibration and tuning of your printer. Um, but for now, I'm Chris. Like and subscribe. I'll see you next week. Peace out.